All right, our first guest. He was the very essence of cinematic cool, and I'm speaking, of course, of actor Steve McQueen, who is and will forever remain one of the all-time great screen icons. Tonight's guest spent over three and a half years researching the actor for his groundbreaking autobiography. I can't read today. I'm so sorry. For his groundbreaking biography, Steve McQueen, Portrait of an American Rebel, which has enjoyed universal praise, four printings, and has spawned numerous documentaries, including 2007's An American Rebel from filmmaker Richard Martin. Other outstanding works in Mr. Terrell's resume include two other McQueen-themed books, The Last Mile and The King, McQueen, and the Love Machine, as well as Sergeant Presley, a portrait of Elvis Presley during his period of military service. It is a great pleasure to have to the show Mr. Marshall Terrell. Mr. Terrell, are you with us? I'm with you. Thank you for the wonderful introduction. Thank you for being with us tonight. I, I, I appreciate you coming on. Uh, I read something very interesting uh, about you. Let's talk a little bit about, about your journey before we get into to sure. Mr. McQueen. Uh, you came from the financial world, actually. Uh, I read it, it working under Charles Keating, and then when that didn't work out, you, you started you started writing. And, and was That's writing correct. always <laughs> writing always a goal for you? No, actually, uh, it, like, like you'd said, I had planned a uh, career in the business field, and um, for some reason, that's my other phone going off. Um, <laughs> I, uh, you know, I, I was a business major in college, and um, and so when I worked for Charles Keating, I was going, I was in college, and you know, thought I was just going to have a life in business, and you know, thought I was going to have it all mapped out, and then. Um, and then, of course, uh, the whole savings and loan industry uh, went under in the late 80s, and Charles Keating went to jail, and then I was kind of out of a job. And, you know, I was kind of forced to ask myself, what is it that I want to do in life? And mm -hmm. writing that biography of Steve McQueen was the one thing I had always wanted to do, even though I had never taken on a literary endeavor before. Right. So uh, it, it just came out, it just kind of came out of left field. And when I told my friends and my family I was doing it, they all kind of chuckled and laughed and said, what would you want to do a thing like that for? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, but there there hadn't been any comprehensive work on 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 McQueen's uh, life, had there? Prior? To no, that. not not to that point. There had been, I think, five books written, but they all were kind of focused on different sections of his life. So I kind of saw where that that one big comprehensive um, uh, work hadn't been done yet, and I saw where there was just this groundswell of uh, McQueen fans just dying for something. For example. Um, uh, last year, um, I did a book on Pistol Pete Maravich, the basketball player. I felt the same thing. And then, of course, boom, two two books uh, on the life of Pistol Pete come out at the same time. So, you know, there's just uh, a certain certain feel that you get for artists who, you know, even though they they've passed away, they're they're going to get their um, they're going to get their review. And I felt that about McQueen at that time. And when that when that movie when when the book came out, the, the movie The Getaway came out at the same time, and McQueen. Right started making his way back into the mainstream. Yeah. Yeah, your dad loved McQueen. Is that is that who you inherited your love from? Yeah, absolutely. When when I was a kid, uh it was funny. He, whenever there was a McQueen movie that came out, he'd take me out of school and we'd go see McQueen together, you know. So you talk about a no, special cool. day and a special memory, yeah. That's and awesome. uh yeah. Anything so that, to get you out of school to go to the movies is awesome in my book. <laughs> <laughs> so you know that 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 is just a, that's all, it's been a special memory. Yeah. yeah. Uh, tell me what his, you know, obviously he's a, he's always referred to as the, the king of cool or the essence of cool. Uh, what was his screen persona? What made him special? What was that identity with McQueen? To me, um, it was a, it was, there was a lot of different things. I think people who are McQueen fan, McQueen fans pick up on this and that is, you know, go beyond the cool um, you and you you study his acting and you you see that here's a guy who can convey so many thoughts and ideas with just a look and that truly is a gift. I mean there aren't too many people that I can think of that are like that and, and nobody certainly did it as well as McQueen. Then you take into account the fact that you know he had tried to portray himself as somebody that he really was not and in, in his personal life he was so deeply insecure. And uh, when you saw that image on the screen, well, you thought, well, naturally, he's that guy. And uh, so he was that guy, but then there was this completely other side to McQueen as well. And that's what makes him so intriguing. Yeah, I um, definitely want to get into the, the off-screen McQueen 
Okay. Um, but you mentioned his his acting chops, and uh, I believe it's actually seen in the, in the, the, the documentary that I mentioned based on your book, and right. in your book as well. Uh, that the, the thing that I always, always strikes me is that scene in Bullet with uh, Vaughn in the hospital, mm-hmm. and and that he cut out pages of dialogue and he said I can just do this in a look. Mm-hmm. Uh, right. That kind of power. I mean, the, the, his face held a camera. Uh, Unlike any anyone else, amazing stuff. Yeah, and and um, you know the the thing that he was doing at the time, nobody else was doing. And you know, McQu- even though McQueen had some some acting in New York, I mean, he really developed as a uh, uh, a film star and a screen star when he took the series One Dead or Alive, and he used that series to experiment. And so he was the only actor that, that at the time was basically cutting his own dialogue and saying less, less, less. And it, it completely worked for him. And today, you see a lot of actors now doing the same. Um, yeah, there's tremendous so, power in that. Uh, yeah. The, the best actors, uh, you, know, you know who's a great actor when they can, when they can be still and, and you're drawn to them. Uh, so. Well, and he gave, he gave Chuck Norris some great advice when, when Chuck was first starting out. Uh, uh, Chuck's first film, I forget what it was, but... You know, he he made McQueen watch it, and, and afterwards, Norse said, "That's the worst film ever." And McQueen said, "Well, it's not bad, but let me tell you what you can do." And and this is and this is advice I use in my writing. He basically said, "Let your screen actors fill in the plot, and then when there's something really important to say, then you say it, because that way, people remember what you say." And I I, I apply the same theory in my writing, and that is, you know, let uh, let other people fill in kind of who Steve McQueen was, and then if you have to use a quote from McQueen, then use it in the right spot. And yeah. so it's just amazing uh, that here's a guy who had a ninth grade education but had these wonderful instincts and used that, and it, it completely worked uh, to his advantage. You know, today he is the most widely emulated actor that's in Hollywood today. I mean, everybody wants to be the next Steve McQueen. Which which brings up the question I I, I had a, a, about uh, about that. Uh, there are always actors that come along, as you said. I remember them saying that about George Clooney. After Out of Sight, he's the next Steve McQueen, <laughs> it's, which is a ridiculous. You know, the next anything is pretty ridiculous. Yeah. Uh, all of us are individuals. But does anybody strike that mold for you from today's crop of actors? I, you know, I get asked that question a lot. It, it, it's hard to answer because everybody is trying to be McQueen. Um, but I guess the person that came closest in my mind, and, and you may laugh, uh, was Kevin Costner. Um, yeah. He, he, he took that. on, a, yeah, yeah he took that. on a lot of McQueen-like roles. He wasn't as tough. He was never as tough as McQueen, but he's a natural actor, and people give him a lot of grief. But if you look at the movies he makes, and you know, his movies of late aren't great, but you look at his early film uh, catalog, like uh, Bull Durham and. No Way Out, and Revenge, especially Revenge. Mm-hmm. Look at Revenge. Um, mm. He reminds you a lot of McQueen. I yeah. see it. I can definitely see it in Revenge and even the Untouchables and No Way Out, definitely. Yeah, and he's spoken to his admiration for McQueen. I, oh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, it, he... it's blatant. Go ahead. It, it's blatant, especially uh, in The Bodyguard. <laughs> well, that was yeah. written. I mean, wasn't that written originally <laughs> for McQueen? Uh, that... That was originally written for McQueen in 1977. He and uh, it was written for he and Diana Ross. And um, for some reason, either McQueen passed or, or just never got into his hands. And uh, it just had floated through Hollywood for years. I think it was offered to Ryan O'Neill, and then Diana Ross, and then just stayed dormant. And then Costner picked it up, and then boom, it was a 400 million dollar hit. Yeah. His biggest movie to date. Yeah. Uh, Obviously, he was a big star, a tremendous star. Did he feel underappreciated as an actor, though? That's an interesting question. Um, the research that I, I, I dug up was basically that McQueen was playing himself. Now, I don't know if McQueen ever really felt um, that, that he was made, you know, I, I, the, the answer to that question is he didn't really pay attention to what the critics had to say. He paid attention to what the fans paid at the box office. Mm. And so he knew that he was the best reactor in film business. He had said that to uh, actor Peter Yates, who had told that to me. Um, 
and yet I feel like there was a lot of insecurity on his part that he did he wasn't truly appreciated. But he he was a tremendous movie star, um, yeah. and 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 the, and the critics in their day were de- were dead wrong about McQueen and his acting because they had felt that he was playing himself, and and truly he wasn't because uh, he w- he was a totally different person in real life. I can't say he was playing himself. If you just look at the variety of roles, like the, you're going to tell me he's playing himself in the Sand Pebbles and the Getaway or the Great right. Thomas I mean, Crown making, Affair. Yeah, the Thomas Crown yeah. Affair, the Cincinnati Kid, um, um, the Soldier in the Rain. I mean, he's not playing. That's just that's narrow mindedness on the critics' part. I always found right. that. I mean, he would right. have a, his characters. Even if you look at his greatest roles, there are distinct differences in yeah. each of those that right. add to it. Absolutely, uh, and, and yet there were there were sections of his personality uh, in those roles. Otherwise, he wouldn't have taken them on. Um, you know, for example, in the Cincinnati Kid, uh, you know, and that that was so beautiful about his acting was that he he really was some of those people uh, in that you know the Cincinnati Kid. He had played cards in New York uh, to you know to, to to supplement his income. And, and in, in the Sand Pebbles, you know, he knew how to take apart an engine. Um, so he knew machinery. In um, in the getaway, you know, he had military training, so he knew how to handle guns. So I mean, there was such a realism that he injected in his roles. But there was there was some of McLean in there. But again, uh, I, I think we all agree that uh, the, the critics wrote him off way too easily in his lifetime. Um, I yeah. must ask Mr. Terrell if you if you I'm sure you have the 2000 uh, movie, The Dow Steve. Have you ever seen yes. that? Yes, I did see it. Wonderful movie. Love that. Love that movie. Yes. And it just, I think it, I just love the, you know, here in 2000, people are still, you know, raving about Steve McQueen. Um, Maybe go home and watch The Getaway again for the millionth time, I think, <laughs> but after watching it. But it's just, I just love that the impact he has. I mean, especially today, you know, the impact is still there, you know, in the yep. stage of the Internet and everything. And people are still, you know, gung-ho for him. I think it's wonderful. Well, and it's 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 interesting in that when I first wrote my book in '93, we we were just starting to get around to that. It, it wasn't always that way. Sometimes it takes 15 to 20 years for somebody's legend to form, and so now you're you're seeing McQueen kind of hitting his full stride now. He's made more now dead uh, in endorsements than he ever did in his lifetime, and he was the highest paid actor of his of his time. So that that really says a lot. He, his his estate makes about 10 million dollars in endorsements a year. Mm. What, what, wow. what would be your what would be your choice for the definitive McQueen performance? I would have to say Papillon. Mm, um, really? Choice. Oh, absolutely. I mean, uh, uh, it, this really truly shows an Oscar-winning actor. Even though he didn't win the Oscar for that role, it was uh, Jack Lemmon in Save the Tiger, which is a movie that a lot of people have never heard of. Um, you, you see a real acting tour de force uh, with McQueen. I mean, he really pushed himself, and he was really believable. And, you know, there's no other way to put it. In my opinion, he danced circles around Dustin Hoffman. Mm-hmm. True, mm-hmm. true. Uh, and, and he worked with some tremendous people. Uh, you mentioned Dustin Hoffman and some great directors, Norman Jewison, and on yep. and on. How was he as a collaborator? Well, it, it's interesting. I mean, uh, in the early portion of his career, yes, he was, uh, you know, he was eager to please. And then, of course, as he became a star... Uh, he became harder and a little bit more difficult to work with. You know, John Sturgis uh, was the guy, if you could pinpoint any guy that was really responsible for McQueen having a career, uh, it was him. You know, he gave uh, McQueen his first shot in, in a big movie, which was never so few, and he followed that with a big uh, co-starring role in the Magnuson 7, and, of course, his breakthrough role in The Great Escape. And then, you know, you fast forward seven years later when they're making Le Mans, and Steve basically pays no attention to him, and is is quite disrespectful to him, and and their relationship is severed. So, um, you know, he he changed. You know, it, it happens in Hollywood when when a star gets bigger and their head gets bigger, their personality changes. And McQueen was no different. And you and you say that he was insecure off screen. How, how did that manifest itself in his life? Well, in his life, um, well, he. he it manifested itself in his personal relationships with people, especially with women. Um, you know, in the movie, he was the calm, cool, collected guy who always got the w- women, and he did, and he did in real life too. But in his relationships, uh, he was terribly insecure. Um, and but the, but the interesting thing is that he used that 
in his role, he channeled that energy into his movie roles. I mean, he was never um, he was never uh, secure in his place in Hollywood, uh, and yet he used that edge um, really to, in, in his film roles. And, and you see that, you know, and if people know that history. They know that, uh, for example, when he finished Bullet, you know, it was it was probably one of the highest grossing films of all time at that time. And his next role was the Reavers, and he had told his uh, friend Robert Relier on a plane they were they were going to receive an award for him being the biggest box office attraction in the world. And uh, the Reavers was going to be comedy, and he told uh, Relier that um, you know this role is probably going to doom me, and it'll probably be the end of me. And he says, "What are you talking about?" And he said, "Well, comedy. You know, I've never been able to really tackle it, and when people see me in this role, I'll be finished." And he had to remind him that they were going to Washington, D.C. to pick up this uh, National Theater's award winner uh, 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 statue so that, uh, you know, he was the number one box office star in the world. And yet, so he couldn't shake that insecurity no matter how big he got. I always felt that that story was really interesting and really told of Steve uh, in his personal life. Yeah, yeah. And you did did another one, another Steve McQueen uh, Work after that with his widow Barbara, uh, called the called the Last Mile. Um, right. What was that journey like? Uh, going going through that journey with with uh, with Barbara. Well, it was interesting because Barbara was always the one person that I always wanted to talk to. Um, you know, for the first book, um, the two wives, uh, uh, Neil, the first one, and then Alan McGraw had already come out with their books, but Barbara had never talked about Steve. So, uh, in a, so that was a that was a part of his life that he was very quiet and there was very little research on. And so, in talking to her, she was able to shed light on those three years, which was basically 1977 to 1980. Uh, the the you know those years uh, uh, after the Towering Inferno, he basically you know just uh, retired from the movie industry. And people always wondered, well, what did he do in that time? And and Barbara shed light on the fact that, well, he rode his motorcycles. They hopped in the truck and they drove to Montana and Utah and, and they just kind of toured the country and he grew a beard and grew his hair long and kind of went incognito throughout the United States, which is I thought was a pretty cool story. Yeah, yeah. And it, 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 you can picture McQueen doing that. I mean, they, that's that's the kind of the McQueen image I've always had in my head. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and, and you also, you're working on a photo book for next year, Steve McQueen, a tribute to the King of Cool, what what and in a 2010 uh, revision yes. or yeah of of the the uh, portrait of an American rebel, right? What new what is there new to discover about McQueen that that, that has surprised you? I mean, you spent three and a half years in research for that yes. initial printing. Uh, what what else has come to light for you about him? Well, uh, a lot of things. Um, when in these past two years, the, the, the Steve McQueen um, um, in, in Slater, they've had the, what they call Steve McQueen Days, which is a celebration. Of, his hometown has now finally kind of gotten the fact that, okay, Steve McQueen is a worldwide icon, and we should be celebrating this man. And so the last two years, I've gone back to Slater, and, and, and I've actually talked to people who knew Steve as a kid, um, shed some insight into his past, and... Uh, was able through the, uh, the, the, in the last year or two, I think they released his military records. So now we know exactly where he went to uh, in his military career. I mean, there was still kind of, kind of a vague picture of what he was doing. And then as uh, Barbara McQueen and I were doing these book signings and, and art exhibits, people would come up to us out of the blue and said, yeah, hey, I, I knew Steve, and, and uh, here's my story. And so along the way, I recorded their stories as well. And uh, so, you know, what I'm getting now is a fuller picture of what, than what I had before. Uh, what the tribute book is basically is it's passages written by people who either knew him or had some, like a one-time dealing with him or an association with him, and it's set to all these pictures that haven't been seen before. So it's not just photos. It's, it's memories of people who actually knew him, had encounters with him. Um, and so all that, of course, will be combined in, in, in the revised version of the book. And the reason why I'm, I'm doing the revised version of the book is because people are still yearning for more information about Steve McLean. Yeah, it's That's it's, good. it's That's exactly great. that. It's a never-ending yearning to feel clo- to feel closer to those those people we consider icons and it, yes. that's certainly a value of the of the biographical form. It, what what are some other values of 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 the biography for you and and why are you compelled to to write them? 
Uh, that is an interesting question. Uh, to, to me, they're like the ultimate jigsaw puzzle. You know, you uh, it, that takes years to put together. For example, this this book I did on Pete Maravich took me seven years. I interviewed 300 people, and it took me uh, two years alone just to transcribe the, the 300 interviews. And, and for reasons I can't even begin to tell you, I don't know why I do it. <laughs> I'm just yeah. for some reason I'm compelled, but I'm uh, I'm compelled to tell the story of the people that that moved me and. Uh, Steve McQueen certainly moved me. I know that he moved a lot of people. It's it's not just about a movie star. It's about a guy who uh, had almost this uh, mythological life, you know, who right. ran away with with the carnival at age fourteen. When I went back, uh, you know, when I heard that, I thought, well, that's that sounds a little too mythological. But indeed, it turned out to be true. He did yeah. run away with the circus, and then you know he. He he did become a lumberjack, and he did all these things, which I think really uh, added to his work. You know, there are some things they can teach you in in film school and and, and in acting classes, but there's nothing like real life experiences, uh, and yeah. that's what Steve McQueen brought to the screen. Yeah. Uh, tell me about Authors for Sale. What, what is Authors for Sale? Well, that, that's what over the years I've had people approach me saying, you know, will you read my manuscript? Will you do this? Will you help me out? And, uh, you know, what I found is basically that that takes time. <laughs> and uh, the, the one thing that people really need um, in order to, to finish a manuscript is, is actually to get a good editor because a lot of people don't want to put their, their work in other people's hands, and, and you have to if you're going to submit that uh, work to a publisher. So that's basically what that service is, 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 uh, is an editing service. From the time that you started writing, this was, um, was this around the period of 92, 93, when you wrote this first book on McQueen. Right, yeah, I started initial research in 89. To now, how have you, how have you grown as a, as a writer? Can you, can you detect that growth in your, in your own work? Oh, absolutely. I'm, I'm so much better. And that's really kind of one of the reasons why I want to rewrite that first book. I, I remember John Lennon in an interview uh, uh, in 1980 before he died basically saying, you know, the, the interview asked him if, if, if you could rewrite or redo all your, record all your Beatles songs, would you? And he said yes. And when I read that at the time, it blew me away because I thought, well, these songs are perfect, but yeah. they're, not perfect. they're not perfect to him. And so uh, that first book is not perfect to me, and uh, it, it gives me another shot at, at, at wanting to rewrite that book because, to me, I've gotten so much better.